Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll make a start. Uh, welcome, my name is David Meppham, and I'm the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. And I'm going to make a few very brief introductory remarks and then chair this morning's press conference. It's great to see you here at the, the press conference launch of the 2013 Human Rights Watch World Report. As many of you will know, Human Rights Watch is an international, independent human rights organization. We work to investigate and document human rights abuses around the world. We work to expose those abuses, particularly through media coverage, to ensure that the, the public spotlight is shone on abuse and those abuses are drawn to wider political and public attention. And we press for change through advocacy towards governments, international institutions and corporations. We press for policies that adhere to international human rights standards and for better and more effective effort to protect and promote human rights. This is Human Rights Watch's 23rd World Report. It summarizes the human rights situation in the 90 countries on which Human Rights Watch works. It also includes some very important um, information on the thematic work that Human Rights Watch does. We do thematic work on women's rights, LGBT rights, business and human rights, health and human rights, and that work is captured in the country sections of this report. And the report also includes a number of key essays, including the lead essay from our executive director, Ken Roth, that he'll talk to you about very shortly. In a moment, I'm going to ask Ken Roth, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, to present the report to you this morning. And then when Ken has finished speaking in about 10, 15 minutes' time, we'll turn it over to you and give you the opportunity to put questions both to Ken, but also to Nadim Huri, who is the Deputy Director of the Middle East and North Africa Division at Human Rights Watch, and has been someone very closely involved in overseeing our Syria work in recent years. Can I ask, when we come to the question session, if you could wait for the mic? We are live streaming the event. It'd be good to, to, to get your name and your institutional affiliation, if you have one, captured on the live streaming of the event. Um, also, because we're live streaming it, there is an opportunity for those of you who are watching online to actually put questions to Ken or to Nadim. And you can do that by sending a, a tweet to at Emma Daly, D-A-L-Y, using the hashtag, hashtag WR2013. So maybe we'll get some questions from colleagues that are watching this online around the world. And one final point about interviews. A number of you have expressed an interest in interviewing Ken at the end of the press conference, and we've we kind of registered that interest from some of you. Those of you who have yet to do that but are keen to interview either Ken or Nadim in the hour that we set aside once the press conference finishes at 11 o'clock, if you make yourselves, if those who want to interview Ken can make yourselves known to Emma Daly, Emma, perhaps you can wave, and those of you who are keen to interview Nadim can make yourself known to Enid Shelmerdine, my colleague there at the back, and we'll try and facilitate those interviews once the formal press conference has finished. Thank you very much. I will turn over now to Ken Roth, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, to present the 2013 World Report. Thank you, David. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as David mentioned, I'm, I'm here to release um, Human Rights Watch's latest World Report. As he mentioned, this is our 23rd annual report. Um, this particular one covers 665 pages on um, the events of the last year in more than 90 countries where Human Rights Watch regularly works. Um, I'll open with a brief overview of events in the Middle East and North Africa, but then would welcome your questions on any place in the world. It's been two years now, you know, almost to the day, since the euphoria of those early days when we saw dictator after dictator toppling in, in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and that you know, early euphoria has given way to you know, often despair, deep concern over what's turned out to be um, a much more difficult situation than may, many perhaps had hoped um, when, when Mubarak or Ben Ali was toppling. You know, we've seen the rise of Islamist political parties in particular who threatened to use religion to suppress the rights of, of women or dissidents or minorities. And it turns out, you know, frankly, that the, the toppling of the dictator may have been the easy part. The difficult part is replacing that repressive regime with a rights-respecting democracy. That said, those who pine for the familiar days of the dictatorship are wrong. In, in our view, um, treacherous as the path ahead is, it is simply wrong to consign people to a grim future of authoritarian rule and repression. So with that in mind, with this report, Human Rights Watch has tried to highlight some issues which, in our view, will determine whether these new democracies 
or whether these new governments genuinely emerge as democracies or whether they simply substitute one form of repression for another. And perhaps the most important thing that we note is um, the need to avoid what we call majoritarian hubris. That is the tendency of um, a once repressed political movement which suddenly gains power to feel that its electoral majority should be able to operate without any constraint. Um, we call that hubris because it, it, it's wrong. Um, being elected is simply one element of democracy. Um, and in order to genuinely um, merit the name of a democracy, um, even elected governments must be constrained by basic rights, by international human rights standards. This tension is particularly highlighted in Egypt, uh, the most important country of the region, and the one that has um, adopted a new constitution that frankly is, is replete with the contradictions between majoritarian rule and basic rights that, that um, need to be resolved. If you look at the Constitution, it is filled with loopholes around issues of, of women's rights, freedom of expression, freedom of association, um, freedom of religion. Um, it also, frankly, abandons civilian oversight over the military. So these you know, important loopholes or defects really will need to be remedied, we hope, through the political process over the next few years. Women's rights have been a particular source of controversy, and, and those who want to avoid respect for women's rights typically try to argue that they are a, a foreign or a Western imposition on, on um, Arab or Islamic culture. Um, we believe that that's a, a false characterization because international human rights law never precludes women from leading a conservative or Islamic lifestyle should they choose. Um, on the other hand, it is governments that are preventing women who want to um, live freely and independently from doing so. And to call that domestic repression a foreign imposition is simply a way of avoiding responsibility for the failure to recognize the rights of women in that society who don't want to um, abide by the, the very narrow constraints that some, usually men, would impose upon them. The issue of freedom of expression has also been a real litmus test in these societies. And, and we've seen an unfortunate tendency on the part of the new governments, really throughout the region, to suppress speech that is critical of them, critical of the judiciary, critical of their religion. Um, there's a particular explosion of, of so-called criminal defamation suits, um, prosecutions of people who are critical of, of the government or the ruling party line. Um, these, this use of the criminal law to suppress speech is antithetical to basic international standards on freedom of expression, and it should stop. We also note that you know, one excuse the governments often cite is that certain kind of speech provoked violence. Now, obviously, when speech you know, incites or advocates violence, when it urges somebody to act violently, that's one thing. But where governments say it provoked violence, that is not um, what the speaker was urging. That's rather what others did in reaction to the speech. And that's a very dangerous argument to, to use because you can easily imagine people saying, ah, the Tahrir Square demonstrators provoked the violent reaction of the pro-government thugs who came and attacked them. Um, we should be very reluctant to accept that, that concept of provocation as a justification for suppressing speech, as opposed for, to stopping the people who actually use the violence in response to speech. The people who argue that um, these kinds of threats to women's rights or to free speech or freedom of religion mean that, that democracy is simply too dangerous in this part of the world. Um, first of all, they, they ignore um, the, the very significant forces both within these societies and in the international community that are pushing back, that are pushing in a pro-rights direction. And we should recognize that these are dynamic situations where there are very significant forces um, pushing to enforce rights and preventing these new electoral majorities from becoming uh, majoritarian uh, dictatorships. Um, but the other reason is that we, we actually have a historical case um, in which a government 
overthrew uh, a near Islamist victory at the polls um, in the name of, of preventing an Islamist dictatorship. That was Algeria. And we recall what happened um, where instead of democracy emerging, we had a decade of horrendous bloodshed and to this day an extremely authoritarian government. So we should be very reluctant to go down that path of those who say that um, you know, allowing a free vote and allowing um, elections to take place in governments in, or in countries where there's a significant sympathy for the Islamists um, is simply too dangerous. Rather, we should allow the elections to go forward and press the new governments to respect rights. Now, obviously, the most severe situation in the region is, um, is Syria, a country that does not yet have the luxury of building a new democracy um, because it's so focused on, on stopping um, the severe violence by pro-government forces under President Assad that have been responsible, according to the UN, for the vast majority of the estimated 60,000 killed um, in the last two years. Um, we've been deeply frustrated by um, Russia's and China's refusal to allow tougher sanctions against the Assad regime, particularly a, a global arms embargo and um, the invocation of the International Criminal Court, which we view as a, a significant tool for deterring abuses, um, not simply by, by pro-government forces, but also by the armed opposition. And so we urge the international community to ratchet up pressure, particularly on Moscow, which is the major obstacle, and which should not be able to simply callously turn its back on, uh, on the, the awful plight of the Syrian people. Um, but even as the armed conflict continues, it's not too early to begin to try to prepare for a better future. And therefore, Human Rights Watch has been devoting significant attention to the armed opposition as well. And, and we're, um, we've been highly critical of their resort to, um, at times, summary execution, um, torture, the fomenting of sectarian strife. Um, these are antithetical to the kind of foundation that is needed if Syria is to emerge from its dictatorial past and, and have a more promising future. So that is, frankly, one of the reasons why we'd like the International Criminal Court to come in, because it would be a way of deterring these kinds of abuses by the rebels as well. Um, we've also believed that it's important for the rebels to articulate an inclusive vision um, of Syria, um, first because that's the right thing to do, because all Syrians should have a place in tomorrow's Syria. But second, um, because it's the only way of making clear to some of the minorities, particularly the Alawites, that this is not a zero-sum game, that, that they do not have to fight to the death, that they can contemplate a change of government and still have a place safely within Syria's future. Now, the international community can play an important role in trying to push this region in a positive direction, to address the, the problems of, of majoritarian overreach, to help curtail the, the bloodshed in, in Syria and elsewhere. And so there are a series of recommendations that we make to the international community, which we believe would, would help it play a more positive role. Uh, the first is that it should be more principled than it has been. Everybody notices when, when the West says nothing or very little about human rights abuses in Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or the UAE. Um, that double standard has to end if, um, if the international community is to be a credible um, interlocutor, a credible proponent of human rights principles in the region. Um, the international community should insist on justice wherever mass atrocities occur. Um, unlike the, the seeming indifference to justice once Gaddafi fell in Libya, or the impunity deal given to former Yemeni President Saleh. Other areas where the international community has been anything but principled with respect to justice would include the pressure that many governments, including the British government, have placed on Palestine not to invoke the International Criminal Court for fear that that would address um, Israeli war crimes. Or the neglect of Sri Lanka's indiscriminate killing of 40,000 people at the end of the war with the Tamil Tigers three years ago, um, uh, killings that so far have had no serious investigation, let alone prosecution. Um, the international community has been inconsistent in the Cote d'Ivoire and the Ivory Coast, um, where it's tolerated prosecution of, of the pro-Bagbo forces, but there's been no progress on comparable atrocities um, by the pro watara forces. Um, similarly, there's been no pressure to um, investigate Rwandan President Kagame and his government for war crimes committed or aided and abetted in eastern Congo 
um, similar to the kind of theory that brought Charles Taylor to justice for aiding and abetting atrocities um, in neighboring Sierra Leone. And finally, there's been um, way too much tolerance of Afghan President Karzai's um, building of a government and, and uh, an allied coalition made up to a large degree of warlords and brutal figures. Um, this kind of inconsistency with respect to international justice is noticed, and it undermines the power and the principle behind, behind efforts to bring to justice those responsible for the world's worst atrocities. Um, a couple other things that um, the international community could do which would make it more productive. Um, one is to recognize that um, the world is very different today from what, was, from what it was even just a few years ago with respect to the rise of social media and what that has meant for the power of ordinary people to influence their government. Um, even in a place like China, we've seen the government suddenly having to be responsive to campaigns on, on Weibo, and the Chinese equivalent of, of, of Twitter or Facebook. Um, in this world of social media, where the general public is a very substantial force for change, a test of a government's seriousness in promoting human rights is whether it speaks to the people. If a government simply engages in backroom diplomacy, that shows it's not serious about promoting human rights. Um, unless it engages this very powerful tool for positive change, the general public, um, it's a sign that the that government is really not doing all it can to push for improvement in human rights. And so this tendency, particularly in China, but really in many countries around the world, for interlocutors to prefer backroom diplomacy in some quiet corner of the foreign ministry is a real sign of um, an insincere effort to promote human rights. Um, finally, to be an effective proponent of human rights, governments must practice what they preach. Um, it's not enough to urge respect for human rights if you don't respect it yourselves. And um, to just highlight a few areas where Western governments in particular have fallen short. Um, you know, the U.S. government has been a, um, a big proponent of fighting torture. President Obama stopped torture, as far as we know, by, by the CIA, but has absolutely refused to investigate Bush's torture. Um, similarly, the British government um, has not pushed to investigate um, its complicity in torture around the world, with the most recent example being the, the two Libyans who were sent back to um, Gaddafi's security forces and, and tortured. Um, a fact revealed only because Human Rights Watch found the documents in Gaddafi's, um, one of Gaddafi's um, security force headquarters in Tripoli, um, not through the Gibson inquiry or the various other half-hearted efforts made in this country to, um, to pursue this issue. Um, to sum up, um, the future of the Arab Spring clearly lies foremost with the people of the region. But the rest of the world can make a big difference. And we at Human Rights Watch believe that everyone has a responsibility to do what we can to push forward and ensure um, a positive conclusion to this historic opportunity for change in the Middle East and North Africa. So while we devote significant attention in this report to the practices of the governments themselves, we also call on influential partners around the world, um, in the north or the south, the east or the west, to do what they can to help um, ensure a positive outcome to um, what has been known as the Arab Spring. Um, I'll stop there, and I would welcome your questions on Middle East or any place else. Thank you very much indeed, Ken. Can I turn this mic on? Thank you. We're opening it over to you now. Uh, there are two roving mics. Um, perhaps the people with the mics can make themselves known. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes, gentleman here. And if you could say who you are, perhaps you could stand if that's possible. Yeah. Say who you are and if you have any institutional affiliation, that would be very sure. helpful. Sure. Um, my name's Orlando Radici and I work at the Jewish Chronicle newspaper. Okay. Hello. Okay. Um, you mentioned the fact that you have faith in the people um, of the Middle East mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the future of their human rights environment. Um, to produce the kind of democracy that you're looking for. Do you, um, do you think there's the same kind of support for that human rights environment amongst the people of the Middle East that you, you mention? Yeah. Thank well, you. Um, in other words, I, I, ultimately, um, I think there's no alternative but to respect electoral choices. 
you know, to start second guessing, second guessing elections and say, no, no, we'd rather have the dictator than, than the person that these people elected is completely wrong. But, but that said, um, we shouldn't simply defer to the majoritarian wishes, whatever they might be. Um, it's important that even majorities are restrained by basic rights. And, and I think this is particularly an issue in, in Egypt where um, Islamist political parties did so well in the electoral process. And there, um, you know, I think there is a, um, a susceptibility to overreach that one sees almost any place where you have large electoral majorities. And it's incumbent, I think, upon you know, the people of the country um, where you do see significant voices pushing for rights, but also the international community to say, you know, yes, we respect the rights of these elections. We were not going to take the Algerian solution and reverse an election. But that said, even an elected government must be constrained by basic rights. Thank you. Are there more questions at the front here? If you could just wait for the mic, which is just on its way. Um, yes, you. hello. Uh, Lorna Tars, Politik in Denmark. Um, you, you mentioned in your report that uh, it seems like the EU has dropped the ball a little bit um, on human rights because of uh, the financial crisis, perhaps. Um, could you say a little bit uh, more about that and how you feel that the situation has gone worse? Yes, I mean, we've, we've been disappointed with a number of elements of, of EU policy. Um, I mean, I, you know, maybe I'll start with China, where, where the EU epitomizes this quiet diplomacy approach. There's, there's one private dialogue after another. And the Chinese government loves that approach because nobody ever hears anything. Um, the Chinese people are ignorant of what's said in the back room of the Chinese foreign ministry. Um, so again, that's an indication of a lack of seriousness to the EU approach to promoting human rights in China. If they really wanted to change things, they would be speaking publicly to the Chinese people who are the most important potential agent of change. Um, but we've also, I mean, other areas where we've been disappointed um, you know, the EU has really dropped the ball in, in Central Asia. For example, they, they completely dropped sanctions with respect to Uzbekistan, and you know, one of the most repressive governments around, and these days don't even talk about Uzbek repression, you know, largely because Uzbekistan is seen as an important transshipment point for, for the troops that continue in Afghanistan. Um, there has been a um, you know, similar lack of vigor in EU um, promotion of human rights, particularly in the Gulf where you know, powerful economic actors like Saudi Arabia or governments that are seen as having some strategic significance with respect to Iran, a country like Bahrain or even the UAE, um, are, are getting away without um, much cost to the repression that they continue to impose on their people. Um, we, do, um, we were glad to see a significant shift in the last year in um, the EU's attitude toward Rwanda, and finally a recognition of the very nefarious role that Rwanda is playing in Eastern Congo. Um, I think there's been a view for, for well over a decade now that President Paul Kagame could do no wrong, driven in part by genocide guilt, the fact that the West did nothing to stop the genocide against the, the Rwandan Hutu principally, um, and, and driven also by, frankly, admiration for um, the economic progress that Rwanda has made under Kagame. Um, and because of those two factors, there's been a real tendency to close one's eyes, first of all, to the repression at home, the, the, the lack of civil society, the lack of opposition voices, the, the, the violent threats to people who do differ from the government. But more to the point, um, to ignore the horrible role that Rwanda has played across the border in Eastern Congo. And finally this year, Despite Rwanda's denials to this day, the international community recognized that Rwanda is providing active, substantial military support to the M23 rebellion, um, the latest incarnation of a series of Rwandan-supported rebellions. Um, and it has been those rebellions that have been a significant part of the, the roughly five million estimated dead in Eastern Congo in the last two decades, um, due directly or indirectly to the series of, of, of armed conflicts there. And so we're happy to see that there has been an a refusal to provide the military support or the undifferentiated budget support that Rwanda needs to maintain that active military role in Eastern Congo. And that is, you know, frankly, one thing that the EU is finally doing right. And um, I, I hope that that recognition will extend to other favorites like, um, like Ethiopia, which continues to receive a massive influx of aid despite the very severe repression there. And I think one of the lessons is, you know, mere progress on economic 
in economic terms should not be sufficient to justify funding the machinery of repression in these highly repressive states. Okay, let's take another question. Gentleman over here with the, with the glasses. Thank you very much. My name is Borja Vergareche from ABC newspaper Madrid. Um, this tension you describe between Islamism and the complicated and complex process of building democracies mm -hmm. has now a new battleground in Mali, which emanates directly from the Libyan crisis, according to many. I was wondering if you could give us a brief assessment, your assessment of the situation there, and how concerned you are and what the latest facts you might have uh, from the situation tell us about the human rights record of the different parties there. Thank you. Okay. Well, well, I mean, first of all, I, I think you're right that the common wisdom is that the, the rebellion in northern Mali was a direct consequence of the fall of Gaddafi, um, you know, the return of, of various, particularly Tuareg fighters from his forces and the, the dispersal of arms from his arms caches. And of course, there's an element of truth to that, but in our view, that's not the whole story for the rebellion in the first place. It was very much the lack of the rule of law in the north, lack of serious economic investment in the north, um, the lack of improvement in key development indicators that all fueled the rebellion in the first place. Um, in the north, we've been deeply concerned about um, the extreme form of Sharia implemented by the, the jihadists who you know, quickly have taken over what started off as a Tuareg uprising but has now surpassed that. Um, and of course, we've, you know, we've seen executions, amputations, uh, the destruction of cultural property. Um, the, it was clearly the, the terrorism threat that prompted the French intervention. And um, while the French forces, um, as far as we can tell, have operated with, with significant care for civilian casualties, they are operating alongside uh, Malian government military forces that have, um, according to the Human Rights Watch researchers on the ground, those forces have themselves engaged in a series of reprisal killings and reprisal disappearances. And we're fearful that there will be more of that unless whoever intervenes, whether it's the French or, or the African Union forces that are soon to join them, do not put serious pressure on Malian forces to respect basic rights and to um, allow the rule of law to emerge in northern Mali um, and not simply substitute a, a new form of ethnic revenge. Um, we've been actively pushing for, um, as international troops come in, for international human rights monitors to join them as a way of, of paying close attention to the behavior of these pro-government troops and to ensure that um, these kinds of reprisal atrocities not continue. Okay, gentlemen there. Hello, my name is Juan Carlos Bejarano from RCN Television Colombia. Um, reading your uh, report on Latin America, mm -hmm. um, what I find interesting is that you seem to be worried about freedom of expression, uh, media censorship, uh, even self-censorship in some countries. We knew about Cuba, but now you're mentioning Argentina, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, among other countries. Why is this happening in Latin America? Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure I can answer why. I mean, in, in a, I mean, a place like Cuba, um, I don't even think it makes sense to talk about new censorship. There's always been censorship there. There's just no plurality of opinion allowed there. Um, in, in Venezuela, this has been a long-term trend under Chavez. Um, if we can still speak about under Chavez, I guess we don't know that for sure. But um, you know, there has been a, um, a very significant effort to dominate the media space and to marginalize uh, media that adopted an independent um, critical voice of, of the Chavez government. Um, and, and Chavez probably has taken the lead in that respect, but we now are seeing various efforts to replicate that in, in some other countries. It's not always the same. And in a place like Argentina, with the, the situation with Clarín, um, it, it's much more complicated. Um, but the, there is a tendency, we've, we've noticed, of governments to, um, to respond to criticism by trying to snuff it out. And it's never, you know, apart from places like Cuba and Venezuela, it tends not to be you know, so overt as locking up journalists but rather the use of more subtle means of trying to marginalize or de-license or somehow um, weaken opposition voices. And, and so that's what we try to highlight. Thank you. I think there was someone else on this side. I'll try and bring everybody in. Perhaps we could just, the gentleman here. Ahmed al Ghamrawi from Al-Shark Lausset newspaper. Um, regarding the uh, countries of 
which have passed the Arab Spring in the past few years. Um, how can you put them on a scale from best to maybe worst yeah. concerning the progress uh, or maybe the regression yeah. in the human rights? And the second thing is um, um, how, uh, how do you look that there is um, a chance for getting better regarding the facts on the ground on those countries? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you on part of your question because we very deliberately don't rank. That's something that Human Rights Watch does, just refuses to do because, you know, we don't want to suggest that, you know, your repression isn't as serious as somebody else's so we don't have to worry about you. Um, so we just, we don't do that. Um, you know, that said, you know, you can look around and, and make different recommendations or draw different lessons from different countries. You know, I think if you, can, you know, for example, compare the constitutional process in Tunisia and Egypt, Tunisia has been a you know, much more inclusive process, which has had the consequence of you know, so far avoiding some of the proposals that would have been quite negative, you know, such as on the complementary role of women or, or um, the, the you know, bringing in sort of narrow versions of Sharia. So you know, we don't have a final product in Tunisia, but the process which has put an emphasis on, on consensus so far has avoided some of the problems that have emerged in the, the kind of rapid, non-inclusive approach that the Muslim Brotherhood used in, in Egypt. Um, in a place like Libya, you know, the dominant problem is very different. The government is saying a lot of the right things, but the government doesn't control a lot of the country. And so there the dominant problem is, you know, how do you ensure, for example, that the thousands of people detained today by militia are ultimately detained by the government, because until that happens, they have no prospect of, of having their day in court and, and, and facing due process. Um, you know, we've seen um, in a number of the countries, you know, a number of the monarchies are adopting sort of modest reforms. Morocco is probably in the lead on that. Um, you know, Jordan is a little behind. But these reforms have not gone so far as to genuinely allow freedom of expression. You take, you take a place like Morocco where you know, the Constitution looks pretty good, um, but then as it's implemented, you see the use of criminal defamation to, to silence dissent and, and you know, ongoing problems in trying to restrain civil society. So I mean, you can go kind of country by country and there are different lessons to be drawn from each, um, but I think you know, all of them still have a ways to go and some obviously have quite a bit further to go than others. Gentleman here, you wait for the microphone. Inigo Gurruchaga, El Correo Bilbao. You criticize the duplicity of governments uh, that do backroom deals and, and don't engage with public opinion. And uh, we all know about backroom deals. But what do you mean by engaging public opinion through social media? What do you mean by oh. that? Well, I mean, what I really mean is just speaking out. In other words, if... Um, you know, typically, if a government is obliged to bring up human rights because of you know, pressure from home, but they don't really want to interrupt the relationship with the authoritarian government too much, they will resort to quiet diplomacy. And they will come and say, we had a very you know, serious exchange of views about this topic, and you have no idea what was said, and there's no serious effort to communicate to the people of that country. So um, public diplomacy is, as it suggests, speaking out. So I don't mean so much that you know, um, you know, David Cameron should get on Twitter for his um, diplomacy, but rather he should speak out. People will then you know, pick up what he says, and the people of the country in question, the target country, most importantly, will be able to recognize that the British government cares about their plight, that, that David Cameron is, is speaking about their problems to their leader. And that kind of public diplomacy ensures that the, the power of the people of a country is enlisted to the maximum extent in trying to improve the, the rights in their country. Okay, maybe we just, just behind you. Yes, please, I will bring everybody in, I'll show you. Thank you, um, Neil Buckley from the Financial Times. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you could give a brief assessment of developments in the past year in Russia and former Soviet republics, which are my particular area, sure. um, and the extent to which, if you see negative developments there, you consider they may be a kind of reaction to the Arab Spring and, and uh, preventive measures aimed at mm -hmm. uh, preventing a repeat of Arab, the Arab Spring in those countries. Yeah. Well, it's, it's sadly, in the last year in Russia, we've seen you know, the biggest backsliding since the end of the Soviet Union. 
And the reason is very much Putin's fear of a popular uprising. Um, we've seen this in the past when there were a series of color revolutions led by NGOs. He cracked down on NGOs. Um, but you know, a year ago when there was significant, were significant public demonstrations, particularly in, in the bigger cities, protesting both um, perceived fraud in, in the parliamentary or the Duma elections and um, protesting Putin's decision to run yet again for president. Um, that, um, those series of uprisings clearly panicked Putin. And he has responded with um, a series of new enactments designed to close the space for dissent. And so we've seen new, pe new penalties for public demonstrations. We've seen a, you know, a new law with a vastly expanded definition of treason that would encompass almost any international human rights advocacy. Um, you know, we've seen NGOs tarred as foreign agents if they receive foreign funds. You know, a series of steps designed to constrain um, the possibility for, for public um, dissent. And, and I do think the, the motivation here is, um, is fear of the Russian people. Um, and, and Putin is determined to do anything he can to prevent the various obvious discontent that exists among many Russians from manifesting itself in, in organized, visible activity. Well, so briefly, the, uh, the rest of the former Soviet the rest, space. So yeah, I mean, you know, we, there, is, there, that, is, is this a tendency you're seeing actually across uh, former Soviet republics? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, obviously the, these countries are also different. I mean, I think the place that probably has been the closest parallel to Russia has been Kazakhstan, where, it, as you know, there was, you know, a, a, an uprising of sort, a very visible strike in demonstrations in, in one of the oil producing regions in the West. And um, that has led not only to a very severe crackdown in that town, but to parallel crackdowns on, on, on various forms of dissent across Kazakhstan. You know, other places like you know, Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan have been so repressive that I can't say there's been a significant change. It's just very bad and has stayed bad. Um, you know, in Belarus, there were you know, quasi-elections this year, but the results where the opposition won no seats kind of speak for themselves. Um, so that also is you know, a place where um, you know, what's often known as Europe's last dictatorship um, continues to deserve the title. Um, but you know, we, we can talk maybe in more detail about some of the others. Okay, let me take some from this, this side of the room. I'm looking to, to bring women in, but very few women are putting up their hands. Maybe this gentleman here could ask a question. Uh, amongst Metro International. Um, you expressed disappointment at the weakness of international pressures such as uh, Russia on Syria, the West on Palestine. Uh, is the Security Council hopelessly paralyzed by its members' competing interests? Well, the Security Council is paralyzed at the moment on Syria. But I, and I wouldn't say it's paralyzed in everything. I mean, it's obviously just you know, a short while ago it, it was able to find consensus on Libya. Um, even just a, you know, a few weeks ago it found consensus on Mali. So I do think that there is a, um, the reaction to the Libya invasion and the sense by a number of countries that NATO overreached, that it stepped beyond its um, civilian protection mandate to move to regime change, um, that yielded a backlash, which I think to this, to this day is driving Moscow. But for a period in there was also driving some of the southern democracies on the Security Council at the time, you know, Brazil, South Africa, India, Pakistan, to um, also adopt unhelpful positions, um, abstaining or voting against resolutions, which made it easier for Russia, backed by China, to, to block any progress on Syria. So I haven't given up on the Security Council. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not one who believes that reform is any time, you know, it's gonna arrive in the near future given the unlikelihood that the P5 wanna give up their, their positions of privilege. But even within this current structure, um, there are times when it's possible to achieve some kind of consensus with Russia and China. Um, my fear with Syria is that Russia has been so obstructionistic that it has rendered the Security Council virtually irrelevant. And, and everybody is now looking at, um, at ways of operating that don't require Security Council approval, which is unfortunate. But that's, I think, the reality that Russia has, has created. Perhaps I could ask Nadim to add a, a couple of comments on that as well. 
Sure. I, I mean, I would just add, I think there's an important role to sort of activate other forms of pressure on the Security Council. And most recently, we saw a Swiss initiative that collected more than 58 countries signing, asking the Security Council to refer uh, Syria to the International Criminal Court. Has that been enough to change Russia's mind? No, but I think if these sorts of initiatives, if they can, you know, if we can push the number from 58 to 100 countries, will exercise some sort of moral pressure on the Security Council. No, yeah, I very much agree with that in the sense that, you know, Russia is quite comfortable standing up to the West, but it doesn't like to be um, outside of a consensus in the global South. And what's interesting about this Swiss initiative is that there were a number of governments, you know, from Africa, Middle East, Asia, Latin America, who joined the initiative. Um, making Russia look more and more as a real outlier with respect to the global concern about the atrocities in Syria. Okay. There's a gentleman here who's been keen to come in, so thank you for your patience. Uh, the first question, please. Uh, my name is Rafa Jabouri, and I work for the BBC. Uh, the first question is about uh, your take on the uh, American administration's uh, tackle of the issue of international terrorism. I mean, three, four years on of uh, President Obama's presidency, and four years to come. So, compared to the to the previous administration, uh, how do you evaluate that? And the second question about Turkey. Uh, you talked about the emerging uh, governments in the Middle East and North Africa led by Islamist parties. And in general, there is a tendency among those parties to refer to Turkey as a kind of role model. Um, when they're asked uh, about the future, they would say, maybe, we will be more like Turkey than any other mm -hmm. bad examples, if you like, of uh, Islamic uh, governments. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, let me take your questions in reversed order. Um, I mean, first, with respect to Turkey, uh, the AKP is obviously, you know, an Islamist motivated party. I, um, I think they t deny that, but there, there clearly is an important role of Islam within the party. The one thing you can say for the AKP is that it has not used Islam to suppress. And so at that level, it is a model. But Turkey has big human rights problems. Um, it, it's, some would say it's leading the world in the detention of journalists. Um, many Kurdish activists are in detention. There are ongoing restrictions on the Kurdish population. Um, there are major due process problems in the courts. So um, I'd love Turkey to be a model for the, for the region, but it's got a ways to go before it really deserves to, to play that role. Now, with respect to Obama's counterterrorism policy, we all had great hopes four years ago. Um, you know, the, the positive thing he did, as I mentioned, is he stopped Bush's torture, but he's refused to investigate the torture. And indeed, a, a big test coming up is that the, the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee has adopted a 600-page report, which we understand highlights not only the wrongfulness, but also the pointlessness, the futility of the torture. Um, and a key test of Obama's commitment is whether he is going to declassify that report so we can all see it. Um, Obama you know, claimed he was going to have trials in civilian court but then caved into right-wing pressure and we're back to the, the discredited substandard military commissions. He said he would close Guantanamo, but in fact, just a few days ago, he closed the office that was assigned to close Guantanamo. Um, so we've um, seen much less progress than we would have hoped. The big new development under Obama has been the use of drones to fight terrorism. And um, that use has been deeply problematic. I mean, on the one hand, you know, drones are potentially very accurate weapons and, and if used properly can reduce civilian casualties. But Obama has refused to articulate clear legal limits to their use. Um, you know, is it a war theory that he's using to justify the use of drones? And if so, how does he define a combatant and how does he um, merge that definition with the so-called signature strikes that he's been authorizing where people just show up at the wrong place and have the wrong characteristics and are therefore deemed a combatant. Um, if it's a, a policing standard, you can use lethal force only to meet an imminent threat to life. Where is the imminence in a lot of these attacks? These are very basic questions that are not being answered. Uh, and finally, um, you know, where is the accountability? So far, it is a purely executive decision-making process. You can't even get a wiretap in the United States without going to an independent judge. But here Obama, you know, through his executive branch on its own, can choose to kill people on the other side of the room. We're um, on the other side of the world. There's not the time pressure of combat here. Um, it's not as if a soldier is you know, shooting at the drone operator. There's plenty of time 
to um, examine whether this is an appropriate target and to make the case to an independent judge at least before moving forward. But the Obama administration has resisted even that basic kind of independent oversight. Okay. We're coming towards the end of our time, but I think there are other people still keen to come in. Please, yes, at the front here. Katie Lee from AFP. Um, I want to ask you about the rise of China. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of analysts expect it to overtake America as the world, sort of dominant world power in the, mm -hmm. in the coming years. So we might well see a world with a quite authoritarian country as the dominant power mm -hmm. in the world. Are, are you pessimistic about that? How is that going to change the game? Well, this is, you know, this coming year is you know, potentially a transitional moment for China. You know, clearly we will have a transition of leadership and Xi Jinping will take over in March. But, you know, will he be a reformer or will he be a, um, a supporter of the status quo? We don't yet know. Um, the, you know, the one positive signal just recently is that there have been a, there have been a series of hints that re-education through labor is going to be abolished, um, which is in a form of administrative detention which authorizes the police to detain people without any resort to the courts. Um, if that's really abolished, if it's not just, you know, a substitute isn't put forward, um, administrative detention in another form, that could be a big positive step. So that's something to watch. We just you know, don't know where that stands. Um, you know, the other, I think, positive development, which I alluded to, has been the emergence of social media as a political force in China. Um, there are 400 million social media users. And the effect of that has been that the government has had to begin to respond to people. Um, just last week, it, it, it allowed free discussion of the pollution in Beijing, something it had never done before. You know, the week before that, it was the, the Southern Weekly episode where, where the government seemed to back down a little bit. Um, there's been the, you know, the, the bullet train incident with the crash. I mean, there have been a series of incidents, the, the, the woman who was forced to have um, a, a late-term abortion. Um, in each of these cases, because of a social media outcry, the government has changed its position. Um, that is encouraging, and w the government is doing everything it can, though, to censor social media. I think that's a losing battle, but it is a, a key battleground for us to be attentive to, um, because I think the government recognizes that despite its desires, it is being forced to, um, to pay attention to public preferences. Now, there still are you know, classic, very severe problems, whether it's um, the, the despair of the Tibetans under repression, which has led to, I think, nearly 100 self-immolations in, in recent times. You know, the ongoing problem of the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. Um, the fact that Liu Xiaobo is still in prison, you know, despite his Nobel Peace Prize. So um, there are enormous problems, but it is a dynamic situation and one that I think is worth um, the worth of kind of public diplomacy and active attention in this next year because this is a year of potential transition. Okay, I think one of our online viewers may have sent a question by Twitter, which Emma will read out. Yes, we have a question from Twitter. Uh, the the uh, user would like you to elaborate on the role of Human Rights Watch towards the increasing number of prisoners of conscience and uh, freedom in the Gulf region. Okay. Well, um, I mean, it's, it's good that that was highlighted because, um, I mean, a number of the countries in the Gulf region really are getting a pass in terms of international pressure. Um, in, in UAE, for example, I think at this point there are over 80 political activists who are in detention, and there's been barely an outcry. You know, in Bahrain, peaceful dissidents continue to be detained. Um, there has been little effort to deal with uh, the torture or the excessive use of lethal violence by Bahraini security forces. In Saudi Arabia, um, there is, you know, although there is a kind of an active social media conversation in Saudi Arabia, there continue to be many, many political prisoners, and the government has not even gone so far as to allow the creation of a penal code, meaning that the definition of a crime is still in the hands of clerics rather than judges and lawyers. So this is a, um, you know, often a black hole with respect to international human rights advocacy, and one that is, you know, far more deserving of attention than it has received to date. I'm just going to ask Nadim to add a few comments on that as well. There's no doubt. I mean, I'll just add a couple of other examples. I mean, Qatar has been a champion for freedom of expression in other countries, but in its own country. They have, you know, detained a poet uh, and sentenced uh, this poet uh, to prison 
because of, uh, you know, the poem had some insulting comments about the, the prince uh, in it. And I think this is the real challenge today in the Arab world, the sort of rich oil producing countries have so far been moving forward in terms of economic development, uh, trying to increase the wealth of their population, but they have not been able, willing uh, to uh, share decision making to allow true uh, reforms, particularly on the political side, but also on freedom of expression. And we've seen that particularly with you know, these new universities that are being opened, that are often partnerships with leading international universities, but when they come to countries like Qatar, like the Emirates, they're not allowed to be a true space of reflection, of criticism, to allow these countries to move forward. And I think this is something we, we've been watching very closely. We have been uh, you know, campaigning on it. We've been trying to raise the cost. We've been doing a lot of uh, advocacy around these uh, issues in countries that have good ties with the Emirates and others, such as uh, Britain, but also the US. Thanks, Nadim. Are there any more questions from the floor? Is there, put one already. Is there, is there anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet who would like to? No, then so you have the last question. Uh, just a quick one for Nadim. Um, we keep hearing more reports of uh, systematic sexual assaults in Egypt, and it's referred to in your report. Um, is that the case, or and if so, who's behind it? I mean, in Egypt, there's been no doubt that the you know sexual assault is increasing dramatically. The problem is it's been mostly committed by private individuals, and the responsibility of the state has been its failure to respond, to react to this, to the point where we've seen you know, locally organized groups trying to protect the Harrier Square or trying to walk women uh, at night. I think the, the answer has to be you know, on two levels. One, the state has to emphasize and start respond to, uh, to this very serious threat to women in Egypt that is really, I mean, cutting across all social classes, all cities, cities, rural areas, uh, and we just have not seen that kind of response and sort of saying, oh, this is, you know, a media hype, it's not true. No, it is true. It is a real problem. There's a real sense of insecurity, um, and that requires, on the one hand, you know, a serious response in terms of law enforcement, and secondly, there has to be a more concerted effort to talk about this issue publicly and to really sort of condemn it and ostracize those who commit it. Because right now, there is sort of an enabling environment uh, where because of this sort of sense that it's the woman's fault, the sort of projection of shame, people are not willing to talk about it. But there's been a lot of very interesting initiatives on the local level. Uh, what's needed right now is more effective government policy. Okay. Were you keen to come in, sir? You can have the very last question. Do you? <coughs> Um, regarding your, your talk about the Security Council and hindering many of, of the um, uh, actions against maybe Syria or something like that, um, some people see that one country is now, one of the countries uh, of the five major countries may face the whole world with the veto. Um, and they see that the veto is against the human rights in itself. So what can the world do? I, for, for that, and when can we see that stop and there is equality in the Security Council to take actions? Yeah. Um. No, I mean, you know, obviously one of the, the real weaknesses in the structure of the Security Council is that, you know, each of the permanent five can prevent serious action against themselves or their, their favorite allies at the moment. You know, the U.S. typically uses its veto to protect Israel. These days, Russia is using its veto to protect Assad. Um, you know, this is it's not something we can immediately do something about other than to raise the price of those vetoes. And so in the case of, of Russia, I mean, for example, you know, Rosenborough Export, the, the principal arms exporter for Russia, which continues to supply Assad, shouldn't be able to just freely peddle its wares at arms fairs outside of London and Paris. Um, there should be much more active, outspoken opposition to Moscow's intransigence on the part of, of governments in the West, but also in the Arab League. Um, there should be, in other words, there should be a price to be paid if this kind of intransigence and indifference to the bloodshed in Syria continues. And I think that's something that, that all governments can contribute to, um, because at some point, you know, Putin's got to be a rational actor and we'll have to say the cost isn't worth it. But we're obviously not there yet. Okay, I think we will leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. I think, as I, as I said at the outset, Ken Roth and Nadim Huri are available for about 50 minutes to do interviews here. 
uh, please make yourselves known to either Enid Shelmerdine or to Emma Daly, who can try to facilitate those interviews. It just remains for me to say thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your questions. Please read the report and encourage your friends and colleagues to read the report. And journalists, please write and broadcast about it. Thank you very much indeed.